Here's what's coming into view on Elevating Denver for June 2022. Many people who are deaf or hard of hearing are music fans. ASL interpreters at Red Rocks makes it possible for those communities to enjoy the live music experience. The first time I, I went to a concert with an interpreter, it was really uh, amazing because I could share the experience with friends. It's National Adopt-A-Cat Month, so come with us as we meet some fuzzy friends at the Denver Cat Company. It's a much more direct and you know warm interaction, so it's not sad. Plus, we get hip-checked by Colorado's first BIPOC roller derby team. And actually, it's the only BIPOC-only team in the world. These stories and more are just ahead on Elevating Denver. June is a month marked as the height of kitten season, when large litters of kittens are born and often end up in animal shelters. Everyone is encouraged to celebrate National Adopt-A-Cat Month. Formed by the American Humane Society 45 years ago in order to encourage people to stop buying cats and instead adopt them. One business owner has made it her year-round mission to help her cherished feline friends find a forever home. I grew up in Saudi Arabia, I'm originally from Pakistan, but you know, the Middle East is a place where cats are extremely loved because the Prophet Muhammad is supposed to have loved cats. For Layla Kari, the admiration she has for cats stems from a deep cultural appreciation of the animals. In 2014, Layla's love of cats prompted her to open one of the first cat cafes in America. Uh, cat cafes were uh, started in Japan and became very popular in Tokyo. There was, uh, there were probably around 70 in Tokyo at one point. I don't know how many there are now, and spread from there. Uh, Purina did a pop-up cat cafe in the United States in Manhattan. Just seeing the pictures and seeing what this was about, I immediately wanted to conceptualize that here in Denver. And I used to be an attorney, and at the time I was still practicing law. I was a commercial litigator, and it was, you know, useful work for sure but it did not have that immediate feedback mechanism of you know, serving the purpose and doing good in the world. And uh, immediately thought, you know what, I'm not enjoying my life as a lawyer and I want to do something totally different. And the Cat Cafe was, strangely enough, the thing that caught my imagination the most out of all other options I had for what to do next, career-wise. Oh, there's just nothing in common between the two, <laughs> so there is that. Motivated to serve her community, Layla wanted to focus on people and the connections they can make with their cats. Her passion allowed her to establish a place that serves as a public space as well as rescue organization. Our business model is basically creating a space where cats who are up for adoption can meet people. And it's not just for the purposes of adoption, it's for the purposes of, you know, hanging out with them and having playtime with them, getting to know them if adoption is in the works, or even if not, just getting to have that experience of being present with an animal who is here. Cat lovers are kind of by definition, they're hanging out with their cats at home. They don't have a public spot with, that they can share with other cat lovers until, you know, the cat cafe. And there was no telling what the market response was going to be like, except it was just positive from the beginning. Uh, even dog lovers who didn't care for cats still supported the concept because they still supported the fact of it being a pet oriented and an adoption oriented experience. Here on Tennyson Street, the location is very commercial as well as very neighborhood focused, so it has both aspects going on. It is also just a very warm and welcoming environment, so when I stepped inside, I signed the lease the next day. I was like, this is something I can work with, here I can execute the concept that I've been dreaming about. And I'd been looking at that point for like four or five months for a good space to show up for me, and when it did, you know, I was immediately like, yes. We are entirely female operated as well. That makes sense since, you know, we're a bunch of cat ladies. That's just who wants to work here. But, but, you know, it's also something that I, as a woman who, you know, comes from a place where women aren't very empowered. And it's something that I love to point out that, you know, we're immigrant owned and woman owned 100% and are run entirely by women. So we have a great little team here who's been with us for years. Even as a retail outfit that went through COVID, we didn't lose a single person. You know, we had the same staff before COVID as we do now and people stick with us. And I, I just love that we have such a strong 
small, local, and independent vibe here. It's not sad here, you know. They are chilling, they're happy, they don't, they're not in kennels, they're not meowing for attention and not being able to reach out to the humans who are there to interact with them. It's a much more direct and, you know, warm interaction, so it's not sad. So we get cats from all over and um, basically it's a matter of driving distance and New Mexico is a great new partner we have. And so there is a pipeline of uh, transports that comes in from out of state, from many different states. We partner with you know, shelters in Kansas and Wyoming and Montana and we have an open door policy to as far as you know, if you have to give up your pet, you have to bring them back to us if you adopt it from us because you want to make sure that you know, we are uh, seeing that cat off to a scarber home. You know, from start to finish, and we're not abandoning them in the middle of, at any point. We always get, you know, pictures back from our adopters of, you know, the cat now chilling in their home. And we've also had many fosters adopt cats and becoming, you know, what they call foster fails. And that's always heartwarming too, because you know these people have seen so many cats come through their homes, and obviously they love them all. But then they f they find the perfect match, and it's so satisfying when that happens. It's been incredible. We've we've had a lot of luck with our location but we've also had a lot of you know just synergy between the community we're serving and what we're doing it just comes together very well having a bipoc only skate space means everything to some skaters because some skaters don't even have that opportunity to be around people that look like them especially here in Colorado I'm Samantha Mack aka Jams Bond I founded the team and actually, it's the only BIPOC-only team in the world. Kind of comes to derby names, you get a lot of people that play, like, they put puns on their names. And so I'm a jammer, which is a person that scores points. And so most of the time, in the jams, they say, jams jamming. And so that's me. And so I know I'm jamming because I'm a jammer, and my name is Jams. I started playing roller derby in 2014. Skating in roller derby has been such a taxing thing for me, being tall, dark skin, type A, very vocal. And so I've been struggling for pretty much since I joined with feeling comfortable in this community and like feeling safe. And I just realized that it was, a, it was not a community built for me. That roller derby itself is not a community built for people of color. Colorado roller derby community, their intention is to be inclusive, but that inclusi inclusivity kind of stops at the LGBTQ community, and I think it needs to really, really look at how they treat their skaters of color. I want it to be where it doesn't belong to anyone. Anyone can access it and feel, they should feel safe, you know? And the only way I could, felt like I could do that was to develop a place where BIPOC skaters could skate, and it be BIPOC only, because then at that point it's safe. I'm Olivia Kayang, and I haven't really decided on my roller derby name yet because I, I am new to roller derby. Having this space is a chance to just be free, to be in a place without judgment, to do what feels right to me and not feel like anyone's laughing at me, anyone's degrading me, anyone's judging me by what I look like. I am really grateful that I have a space like this where I can not only learn a new sport, but also be myself. My name is Tammy, and it's to be determined. I kind of want to have a name that is a positive representation of Chinese culture, because there aren't as many Asians participating in Derby. With the rise in Asian hate and just the conflicts that I've experienced in the last couple of years, people were telling me to go back to China, to go home, and just really horrendous things that I was shocked about. And it really hurt me personally, but the Shiners provides a place where I'm safe and accepted there aren't stereotypes um, or being objectified, and so it's, it's a tremendous community. And JAMS has created this space for all of us to be able to learn roller derby, play roller derby, and just be ourselves. I'm just thrilled to be a part of the Colorado Shiners, 
and a part of roller derby and it's so exciting and I'm hoping that other people who see this that see me um, can relate and be like you know what if she can do it I can do it too. We come here to skate and to get the accessibility of skating into the BIPOC community here in Colorado because there's a huge misconception that there are not a lot of BIPOC skaters and that's not true. They are just, they just don't know anything about Derby and Derby is very expensive. I know that without this space there are people that could not afford to play roller derby. There, there are people that could not literally just have the accessibility to even try on pads, to even go out here and see if it's something that they want to do. So we are trying to bring it to them for free so that they can learn about it, become obsessed with it like everybody does. We have partnered with uh, a local skate shop uh, and they provide us with pads and they provide us with heavily discounted gear. We have also partnered with a local company called uh, The Rainbow Dome. They're a skating pop-up event place and every other month they provide us with donations that allow us to buy gear for our skaters. I have found that people of color want to play roller derby. As much as people like to say that it's difficult to find brown people that want to play derby, it's not. You just have to put in the effort to go into communities that are not built for white people. Let them know that this is a resource for them and we found a way to do it. I know personally without this space I would not be playing roller derby. I wish that was not the case because I know that there are hundreds of people of color like me in other places that because they don't have something like this that they don't skate. And so our community loves you and you can always come and skate here. It's completely free. There's no commitment. You can come once, never come again. Come every three months, come once a week, come every time. It's completely accessible. Our goal is to get you out here to just try it. And even if you don't want to play roller derby, we offer free skate lessons too. And we're also here, even if you don't want to learn to skate, we're also just here for vibes, so. I think it's important to have interpreters at concerts and because deaf and hard of hearing people like music too and they, um, they have the right to have access to the same shows as hearing people. My name is Rob Kirk and this is my wife, Marissa. I was born um, hearing and I got sick when I was a baby and I lost 90% um, uh, of my hearing. So I wear hearing aids and I use sign language. Growing up, I didn't really enjoy going to concerts because I couldn't uh, hear the sounds as well and I couldn't uh, hear the vocals. So it wasn't fun for me. My old hearing aids had old technology and it's um, hard to uh, describe to people how the sound the music is like, it's a, a chunk of sound that comes to your ears, but you can't tell the difference between a guitar, you don't know what's the piano, what's the drum. It's just like one big chunk of sound. Around 2016, my friend told me there's a, um, a band that had an interpreter. And so I was really excited because I'd never seen an interpreter at a concert before. So uh, we went to Red Rocks and uh, it was the first time I saw um, a performance with an interpreter and it was just a really incredible experience because I've never had that access before. My name's Amber Whalen and I'm the owner of Flow Interpreting. Flow Interpreting was set up in 2016. We specialize in performance interpreting, specifically meaning concerts and plays. I grew up loving music, going to a bunch of rock and roll concerts, punk rock when I was younger, rap shows. And I thought about it and I knew deaf clients were coming up here and I wanted to give them the best service possible. So as a person who loves music and loves interpreting, that's why I started it. During the show, um, how we go ahead and deliver the lyrics and perform is we ask who the client is before we even come to the show. That'll tell you if they are pure American Sign Language, which is kind of backwards from English, or if they want straight English, word, 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 just keeping up with the artist. To prepare, we download all of the lyrics on an iPad. We do study them, but we have that for reference in front of us in case we need it. Um, aligned to sound, we have in-ears for clarity, for lyrics, and then we always have a light on us uh, illuminating our hands. When we get here, we'll meet with the deaf client, make sure we know their sign style if we don't know them, um, and then go from there. I think the most important thing is knowing it's not about us. So a lot of my clients, they're here for the rap show. They're here for Christian rock. Like I said, they're here for rock and roll or a country musician I've never heard of. I poke around with the people who contract with me, see if you already know the music, 
and if you're comfortable doing it, and then they come on out. So that's the repertoire I have with my clients, is to let them know I'm gonna get somebody who's gonna match what you want, and if not, I'm gonna try my darndest to study it as much as I can. I believe that ASL services are important to be offered anywhere, but specifically for music, because of that community feeling. So the biggest question I get is, why do deaf people go to concerts? I think that we all go to concerts, A, because we love the band, but B, there is a community there, and you get that vibe, that feeling of just being with other people who love the same thing you love, so that's why I think it's most important. Red Rocks is like a church for people who love music. They come here from all over the country, so. The first time I, I went to a concert with an interpreter, it was really uh, amazing because I could share the experience with friends, and um, you know, I have a lot of friends who uh, uh, enjoy music and go to concerts, so that now I can share that uh, moment with them. So since 2016, I've gone to many, many shows, probably 50 to 75 shows, a year. Uh, maybe more. Maybe more. <laughs> if we weren't an interpreter, we wouldn't probably go to the show because it's not, um, it's enjoyable and we want to enjoy the full experience. I'm really grateful that we can enjoy music together. Um, I also love that I get to meet people in the community through Rob and share that experience with them. And it's really neat because it's so new that not many deaf and hard of hearing people are aware they have um, access uh, through interpreters. And so hopefully, you know, more and more um, people have been exposed by it and they could tell their friends or tell their family, you know, maybe they have deaf or hard of hearing friends and family and say, hey, you can come to the concert and we can uh, share um, a show to get, uh, together. Uh, they have interpreters and, you know, they can, everyone has access to it. So I think it's really neat that hearing people are getting exposed to it and deaf and hard of hearing people have uh, more access any uh, venue you go to, you, you should request an interpreter and you know, you'd, you'd be surprised that they will provide an interpreter and you will really enjoy the ex uh, experience more. And you might even meet other deaf and hard of hearing people and uh, maybe make some new friends and, uh, and maybe you'll want to go more and more shows if you know they have interpreters because that it really opens up a lot of opportunities. As a sister of Loretto, it is my privilege to thank you for coming to celebrate Pancratia Hall's new life. With those words, Sister Mary Nell Gage welcomed community members to celebrate the grand opening of the Pancratia Hall Lofts in Southwest Denver. These 72 affordable homes are the first in a series of projects that will breathe new life into the historic Loretto Heights campus. I'm just so happy that this is the first thing that we're celebrating here. It really celebrates community. Not only that, it celebrates the spirit of Loretto, service to the community. The Sisters of Loretto called this 70-acre site home for 100 years. Founded in 1888 by Mother Pancratia Bonfies, the site housed and educated generations of students until Loretto Heights College closed in 1988. 1988 they left here, but their heart is still here. So to have the former dormitory classroom building become housing for first-year teachers, they'll find a home here. In the Catholic tradition, May 12, today, is the feast of St. Pancras. Don't we know that Pancratia is watching over this new life? The site was home to Takeo Loretto Heights College and then Colorado Heights College from 1989 to 2017. Once the college closed, the site faced an uncertain future. But Councilman Kevin Flynn immediately formed a steering committee to determine what would become of the area. So we can't let this campus go the way of so much that we've seen around the country that falls apart, that's historic, that carries our legacy, carries our history. We can't lose this. What does the community want this to be? I'm standing here today in front of the very first thing that was important to people, and that was to house working families, because that's what the spirit of Loretto was all about. 
What followed was a public-private partnership that included extensive community outreach and engagement. The direction has always been to acknowledge the legacy of the Sisters of Loretto. Our goal was very simple. Respect what was started on these grounds 134 years ago by Mother Pancratia and create a natural project that lifts its community and celebrates its history. All aspects of the community voice challenge the project to stand on the shoulders of those who came before us. Because of the process of listening to community voice, the project does have a spirit. That is not to say that the community members, the Sisters of Loretto, or the city, received 100% of what they were seeking. In many cases, we had opposing wishes that simply were impossible to coexist. But again, the results are amazing, whereas everybody got something. The result of the process are 72 affordable units from studios to four bedrooms that can all be had from 30 to 80 percent of the area median income. Families can live here, folks. Families can live here. That is something to celebrate. Families can live here. The units are all unique and display the charm and character of the building. This includes the breathtaking four-bedroom unit that was once home to the chapel. You can see behind me we have historically preserved lighting as well as uh, re-glazed and preserved uh, windows. Uh, as Hartman Ely Investments is very good at historic preservation and pays great attention to detail. Now I'm in somebody's kitchen and dining room. Uh, and that's just the beauty of creativity shown in affordable housing here in Denver. These units are just the start, as the future holds many more opportunities for both this campus and other affordable housing in our city. I'm also proud to tell you that together with our partners, we have a strong pipeline of other affordable housing projects. Today, a total of 1,202 affordable housing units that have received city financing are under construction, our preservation, at 25 different sites throughout the city of Denver. We have an additional 779 affordable homes in the planning stage, anticipated to break ground approximately sometime this year, so I'll be at another ceremony. And so today, this is no short feat. We take one step forward with 72 units, recognizing the opportunity to house our families who are housing insecure. Sometime in the future, this is gonna be such a vibrant community. There's going to be senior housing, there's going to be the performing arts, there's going to be community center, there's going to be workforce housing. There's going to be housing for people who are pretty well-to-do, frankly, because that's the kind of community we're trying to build down here. The Denver Art Museum has a mission to enrich the lives of current and future generations of Denver residents. Committed to the acquisition, presentation, and preservation of art, the museum does this through their permanent collection, community programs, and special exhibitions. Well, we have um, 12 different collections and I think 15 curators and associate curators that are working with the collections and they come up with ideas. And sometimes the ideas are very closely connected to our collection or sometimes we just show something because we don't have it. So a few years ago we did a big show uh, with uh, Cartier, the jewelry house, or the Star Wars show that we did a few years ago. That was just something we thought um, would really resonate with our agenda to highlight creativity, to highlight the artistic process, and in this case that goes into jewelry making or making a great film. Artists are out there and they work not just behind an easel and with a paintbrush, they work in all different areas. They work in the movie industry, they work in um, design, they work in graphics, they work in, in, on the web. And I think our role as a museum is really to shed light on all of these different creative people out there. Art and creativity has a huge role to play in the community. The Denver Art Museum serves to provide unique exhibitions, learning opportunities, and educational classes as part of the cultural fabric of a healthy community. Places like an art museum is also a place to connect 
um, with family members, with other community members. And so uh, we've heard from our artist community, for example, that the art museum is a really important place that sustains them and their creativity. And so there's a lot that, that an art museum like us does for the community. I think about one of the, the fundamental things is, is our field trip opportunities for, for young people. So we have a, a very dynamic field trip program. We're a place where kids are really seeing uh, the wonders of the world and, and, and can explore it across time um, and geography. We have lots of classes and courses that um, people can take. And we also, as a result of, of just having built this learning and engagement center, have all these new workshop spaces. And so we have classes, art making classes for adults that are taught by teaching artists in the community. The Art Museum is nearly 130 years old, but for the first 50 years, Denver did not have a formal place to house its art collection. Pieces were housed in mansions or outside the mayor's office in the city and county building. But in 1971, that changed. And that's when this building that we're in, the Ponte building, was built, very visionary building, at a time where usually a museum had to have columns and look like a Greek temple and big stairs in front of it. The community really opted for some uh, Italian modernist who came up with this very amazing, unique structure. We're the first high-rise museum in the world, actually. When this building was built originally in 1971, Denver looked very different than it did today. So um, there were a lot of the, the, what I call the unsexy parts of a building that needed to be fixed. So, you know, we had to kind of think a lot about who is the city now? We had to think about the number of visitors visiting us, and so we had to really make a, upgrade a lot of our amenities. And it was not just a renovation. It was as well a complete overhaul, a rethinking of what is a museum nowadays and what does it need to be to be relevant to a big, very diverse community that we have here in the Denver metro area. A lot has changed since the museum reopened its doors in October of last year. Gone are the two classrooms, replaced by an education center with multiple workstations. The Creative Hub provides visitors with a chance to see live performances or host clubs and cultivate learning opportunities. The Art Museum is committed to the greater community to not only serve as a museum, but be a place to learn about and make art. One thing we are particularly proud of is everybody under 18 is free. So that's guaranteed by some donors and some sponsors that we work with. And we have as well a whole variety of free days over the year uh, where the museum is free for everybody. I'm really proud of this institution for wanting to build something for people. The idea that museums are for families, you know, museums that are places to make art and get messy, these are all the ideas then that inspired a lot of the interactivity that you see around the museum, the building of the Learning and Engagement Center, the building of outdoor spaces. We have a new amphitheater space where we can do outdoor performances. So we really are setting ourselves up for a future that we can't even imagine. Stay elevated by subscribing to the city's YouTube page for these stories and more. And stay tuned to our social media channels for more content. Don't miss our new episodes of Elevating Denver, premiering each month. Thanks for watching, Denver.